Well, hello, Mary. Lovely to see you today. How are you doing? Hey, how are you? I'm okay. Um, I'm sporting. It's warmed, up. it's warmed up a bit here in New York, and I hope it's warmer there in the UK. No, it's it's very cold and humid. Um, mm. And yeah, it's, it's good old London, British rain weather. Um, mm. Um, but I'm cheering everyone up today by uh, wearing this rather glamorous hat from a friend of mine called uh, Basha Zajitska. She made this beautiful antique. If anyone thinks they're real, they're not. They're antique from the 30s. Oh, lovely. Lovely, lovely fruit there. Yeah. So um, how are you doing today? Good. I was thinking uh, we would talk about our mothers today and uh, and I and the refugee experience because I've been thinking so much about our dear Ukrainian friends. Yeah, we we, we want to send as much love as we can, and um, you know it's um it's historical moment now, isn't it? Um, for all of us. Mm. Yeah, we learned a lot from our own mothers, and um, you know, where do we start with this huge topic? It's a big topic talking about mummies that are no longer here that are absent because we've both both our mothers have departed, haven't they? Yes, mm -hmm. my mother died uh, uh, more than a decade ago, um, mm -hmm. but she was the, my inspiration for wanting to go back to Poland and. Um, Unfortunately, she never got to go back. Uh, but she was born just outside of Warsaw. And when the war began, she was a teenager. And one day she was going on some kind of a mission for her mother, who was a teacher. And uh, she got caught in a street roundup and they never saw each other again. Her mother died during the war. And her mother, her brother and her sister had already been taken for forced labor and I found this picture not too long ago. This is what she looked like. Oh, she was being. Oh, I just lift it up a little bit more because we can't really see. Yes. Okay. Great. And do you know when that picture was taken, Mary? Yeah. Mm. That must have been taken about 1942. But you can see how sad she is. This is how she looked before the war. How, and how old was she there? Here she's about 12. Right. Just about 1939, 12. Okay, so you're talking about what year then when she was rounded up? Around 1941, 42. So she was just a teenager and she was so scared. I can see from this picture that she was so scared. Yeah. And she ended up in a subcamp of Buchenwald. Mm -hmm. uh, and she was there for several years, for you know, almost five years. And uh, when the camps were liberated, the area that she was in, all those camps, uh, they were they were all there was whole this whole Buchenwald complex. All the prisoners, you know, those who could walk, just fled. A lot of because a lot of the com the commandants knew the Allies were coming and they left. the The Germans left. As, uh, or they disguise themselves as civilians or they disguise themselves as prisoners, they, they were scared. And so there was just chaos there because some of the prisoners took over and they were those that were healthy and could could had any kind of muster in them were just tearing those uh, German soldiers who had been commandants in the camps, they're tearing them apart limb from limb. And it was just chaos. So you can imagine how it felt for a young girl a young girl. Mm, terrifying. What was her name, Mary? What was her name? Her name was Clotilda. Say that again. Clotilda. How she was named that? for the uh, patron saint of France who brought Christianity to France. And I have a theory about this because it's sort of a strange name, which is how I've been able to find a lot of her records, is yes. that she was a late life baby for my grandmother, whose name was Maria. I'm named for Mariana, Marishka. I'm named, my name is Mary. I'm named for my grandmother. And 
she was born in the new free Poland, the new free Poland. So uh, the Poles, the, the patriotic Poles of that era were very sim uh, in simpatico with the French. And so I think naming your baby, Clotilda was rather like naming um, your newborn in America, naming them America, you know? <laughs> she stood for the new free Poland. Oh. And, uh, and, and you have such um, a link with her as well, don't you? Like emotionally to Poland, because very an, much. Yeah. Um, so, if you could think of like one thing that was the most, I'd say the most pronounced thing that your mother has left an impression with you about Poland, what do you think that would be? <sighs> Or two things. It's not just one. Uh, sad, you know, because I have to. I have. I. I mean, more than anything, I would say longing. You know, my mother longed for her home, homeland, her in, entire life, and for the family that wasn't there. You know, who had all died. She was sort of all alone in the United States, and very few people understood anything about what she had been through. Um, when she came. I think Yes, the so values, you know, what you get, what you get from uh, a person who has had everything taken away from them, is you grow up with uh, the understanding that everything can be taken away from you. So, no possessions matter. It matters what's in your head. It matters what books you've read. It's it matters uh, that you can that you have faith that you could that will sustain you uh when when you're going through hard times and that's how i was raised it was difficult to be an american kid with a polish mother who didn't think possessions were important only books were important who didn't think uh tv or disneyland were important only going out in the woods and knowing how to make a fire in the woods was important because you might have to do it one day you right. know so she was always packed and ready to go in a way she exactly. was always ready yeah exactly. that's, that's a very uh, traumatic thing to have experienced as a young person and and of course this reality has uh, now come into the forefront with the ukrainian war situation and the right and, and this is what i think about a lot and i wanted to say something about this because um, my mother, uh, after the war, you know, she tried to go back to Poland, but they were repatriating Poles like her from families like hers. The Soviets were sending them to camps. And she said, you know, I had been in a camp. I didn't want to go to another camp. So uh, she was sort of wandering around like a lot of other refugees of that time. And it was people, strangers, a chain of salvation who took care of her. I mean, uh, you know, she hadn't been able to wear underwear for years. She hadn't washed her hair. She had no clean clothes. She hadn't had a bowl of soup. She had no warm place to sleep. And strangers gave her those things. And then they helped her cross borders illegally and they took care of her and they got her into convents. And often it was women, women who met her there and, you know, bandaged up her wounds and, uh, got her to a safe place and then women in in the UK who got her into schools there were this whole group of volunteers who ran homes for Polish orphans of the war and schools for Polish orphans and they all took care of my mother and many other women like my mother who had no families to go to go back to and who had had this horrible experience where they hadn't been able to go to school. They were kind of feral, feral kids, you know, they could have been very, very wild if it were not for all of these women. And there were uh, British patriots who, British uh, volunteers, aristocrats who took them in uh, during the summers and gave them a chance to, to spend time in a you know, beautiful English manor house. And then there were people who took care of her and helped her get a scholarship to the United States. And so uh, often uh, she didn't know the names of any of these people, but every one of them uh, saved her life. And they, they made, I, I owe my life to them.
And I know that whenever my mother talked about those strangers, she, her eyes would fill up with tears. So when I think about the refugees today and how important it is to help them, you have no idea what a difference you can make in the lives of these people. And right now, we in the United States have been through a period where we've had a lot of talk about building walls and keeping refugees away. No refugee ever leaves their homeland by choice. And you, none of us knows when we are going to be at the mercy of one of these strangers. So I have incredible compassion for those people who are crossing the borders right now. You, um, can you map the geography of her um, transit from, you know, Polish territory through to America? Do you know where she stayed roughly in which countries and how she got to America? Yeah, it was the one part of her wartime experience that she could talk about. She couldn't really talk about the time in the camp. You know, she always used to say, well, I skipped that part, you know. It, it, I don't even know if she remembered it. She rem had any memories of it anymore. But the time afterwards was the time when she was uh, felt that she had some hope for survival. And, uh, and, and the camp that she had been in was in Germany. And there was also in Germany a, a Polish POW camp. And those officers who had been interred in that camp the first thing they did when those camps were liberated is go out and look for, uh, for refugees. They knew there were children wandering around and they said, those kids are not going to be wild. You know, They are Polish citizens. And they also thought we're going to win the country back and we're going to need this generation. So they were looking for kids like my mother. And as soon as they found her, they got her into a school in that POW camp. But then the allies closed down those camps and those kids were supposed to go back to Poland, but she knew she couldn't go. So they had to go illegally to Italy where the Polish army in exile was. And they had to cross borders at night to get there. And that's when another group of strangers, total strangers, uh, you know, took this band of kids uh, across the Alps and they pretty much had to move uh, to be still and hide when the searchlights were on them. And then when the searchlights turned, they moved. And then when the searchlights were on them, they went still. So it was like a two or three day trek. And she's remembered, my mother always remembered that she was holding something a little bag with little things that the Polish officers had given her, a little atlas and a little Bible. And she was sliding down these muddy Alps and she lost that bag. So after that, she never wanted to get, uh, she never wanted to get too attached to anything ever again. And no purse, no nothing. She had recurrent nightmares of losing her purse because that little bag was all she had and she lost it. But then she was in a convent, you know, in Italy. And then those Polish officers who were in the army in exile in Italy, they had stormed Monte Cassino with the allies and helped to take it. And they were very, very brave. They, you know something about them. Katie, you wrote about them. Well, the, I'm just, yeah, the, the battle. Anders of the army. Army. Yeah, the, the wonderful victory, the Polish victory. I was just coming back to your mom. I mean, it's not, I'm very well known that there are ch Polish children or Polish people in concentration camps. I mean, it's a very untold story in a way that um, three, three million Poles were um, concentration camp victims, including my own grandfather, um, who was hidden by my grandmother during the Second World War in actually um, the mountains where the SS used to take their holidays. So it, it, it's, a, it's an interesting, very, very deep history that your family must have, um, it must have been shocking to know about and not be able to talk about it. Mm. It was because uh, we didn't learn about it in the American schools that I went to. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when I would say my mother was Polish and Catholic, but she was in one of those camps, people didn't believe me. They thought I was lying or that I misunderstood. But there were many, many, poly the first, you know, the first uh, 100,000 prisoners of Auschwitz were all um, Polish uh, 
a lot of them were aristocrats. They were considered to be a threat to the invade, you know, to the invading uh, army, and uh, so they would just round it up and 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 interred in in Auschwitz so they wouldn't cause any trouble. Young men, you know, professors, uh, journalists, writers, artists. Yeah, civil servants, teachers. Civil servants. Yeah. Anyone who had any information, exactly. Because obviously um, an aggressor always goes for the cultural elite and it always goes for the educated elite and the intelligentsia. And um, it's a very untold story across the whole world, isn't it? The, the, the people in Poland who had to also endure incredible cruelty um, with regards any religion that they, they were worshipping, because there's so many different religions that were in these camps as well. And I was going to ask you, you know, um, did you manage to get, you didn't manage to get to talk to your mother, you said you, you didn't, she didn't really open up about her time in the camps, did she? Um, every once in a while, a story would come out, every once in a while, almost, almost uh, uh, as if she couldn't prevent it, it just was a memory that would pop out, and she would say something, and, and then she would re-experience what she had gone through, but very, very rarely. And if you asked her to talk about it, she clammed up. It was just something she couldn't talk about. Did she have behaviors that you couldn't remember that seemed a bit strange when you were growing up? Were there any kind of behaviors you can remember? Did she hide bread or anything like that? She was afraid of, um, She. it was very important to her to be able to go without food <laughs> because she had experienced starvation and, and she almost, um, I had a huge appetite as a kid and I was a big kid and I was growing fast and it almost scared her. And, you know, she didn't like, she, she put me on a diet when I was um, 12, because I think, I think that she was looked at me and she said, when I was 12, I went without food and, My mom and did. <laughs> you need to go without food. You know? yeah. Did your mom do that? Yeah, my mum did the same thing, obviously, because she's a child of the Cold War, so they they starved people in the Cold War as well. So it, in Poland, you know, these became poor Poland, the allied, the only allied nation to be slammed behind the Iron Curtain and become a satellite state of the Soviet Union against its will because of the Big Three's decision to chop up the borders at the Yalta Conference for 45 February, February yeah, 1945. So my mother had that as well. She's and even on her deathbed, she said to me, "My goodness, you're putting on weight." Yeah, it's, it's really, really, yeah, big deal. That was a big deal. Big deal. My yeah. mother would sometimes open the refrigerator and she would just turn around and look at me and say, "You know, you can go a very long time without eating." <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's enough if I can't do it. 250 calories a day, just one bowl of soup and a piece of bread. You can go for months. My mother said months the same thing. Months. Honestly, my really? mother, yeah, my mother said the same thing. One, one potato, you put it in the ground, <laughs> and then a year later, it comes out the same size. That's all I <laughs> was just saying. Like, I think we've we've definitely absorbed some of that, and especially within our work, you know, I mean, I think about my grandmother who had nine children, two died of starvation during the war, and she had to hide my grandfather who escaped from Auschwitz in 1941, uh, actually, 19, yeah, 1941 too. Um, and, you know, this place where she lived, Mienzi Brodzi Bialskim, which is seven kilometers from Bielska Biała, it's only a, a, an hour's drive from Auschwitz. So my grandfather, God knows how he managed to get there, um, because the SS had taken the prisoner details and put it on the on the card and everything. So they had the address where he was. Did you ever, look, did you ever find out why, um, what, you know, what, uh, under what, what terms or under what uh, purportedly, you know, they had reasons like why he was sent, because because those early Polish uh, people that were sent to Auschwitz, they had records that said they were things like they were bandits, you know, they were um, troublemakers, they were in the streets after curfew. My mother was considered to be a thief, you know, mm -hmm. 
because well, she was do, doing something. I always think, you know, I look at my grandfather's prisoner card and it says Schlosser, locksmith. And I laugh every time <laughs> I read this. I think, well, it was a very good lock. You could get out. Um, but he he was in he was in several camps before then. You see, he was in Peungulf. Um, which not many people know about because there were 3,000 camps, concentration camps in Poland uh, that were built by the Germans. And, um, and people would be, you know, there'd be 200 in one, there'd be 1 million in another, there'd be like 400 in another. Yeah. So yeah. he then graduated to Dachau somehow. <laughs> he, he went to Dachau and then he escaped. Then they caught him and then he was sent for correction to Auschwitz. Um, and whenever I, I, I look at the volume that they have in the Museum of Auschwitz and I see that, Correction or whatever it is in German, um, I just think, as an artist, I think I, I'm probably sent for correction many times. I always say some things that are not quite right. And I, don't, I think some of that blood has, come, has, has permeated through the art that I'm creating, the music. And the the attitude definitely, you know, I, you know, um, I look, think of my coming back to the mother thing. You know, I think about my grandmother having to hide her husband, who was absolutely traumatized after being in these camps and was, you know, going through extreme PTSD um, and aggression because that's part of it a lot of the times, and also having to live say half a kilometer from where the SS used to take their holidays and um, I, I think about the females in that situation my auntie Emily who still remembers the smell of the SS man's boots as he kicked her in the face when she was three years old after he asked her where is your father and um, you know obviously she knew that he was in the house but my grandmother had trained her to say he'll be he's gone to Breslau and will be back on Monday, something so crazy. And the idea that my grandmother had the capacity to come up with that story, to come up with something so um, clever and yet neutral that would dissuade um, an SS man without a gun. I, I find that remar the remarkable strength of Polish women. Um, and your mother, I, I think, has the similar trait to my grandmother and my own mother you know having this incredible strength and of of mind and of survival in the worst moments and the darkest moments of their history um you know so um yeah you know this 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 kind of um process that we are going through as artists in our own lives is somehow unlocking some of those blocks that our mothers and our grandmothers had to endure um, and the damage of war, which is something that, you know, the Ukrainian people are going through now and will always be scarred by that, that they had to leave their home. The home where, for women, it's the home where they had their babies or they had their um, links with life. All their, all their dreams, all yeah, their dreams. Yeah, dreams. And uh, it's just this displacement of the, if you like, taking away the home, taking away the heart of the home. It's just horror for not only the men left behind, they have to leave their husbands, their beloved husbands, in a war zone because obviously they're not allowed to leave if they're over a certain age um because they have to sit and fight and they don't want to leave they want to stay and fight and it's dreadful it's dreadful and for those people who are remaining who are very brave and they're remaining and they don't want to leave their homes you know it, you know our hearts absolutely go to every single refugee on the planet who is having to leave their home no one wants to leave their home contrary to what a lot of the media says nobody ever wants to leave their home or to be forced to leave their home it just doesn't work like that life isn't like that yeah so true mm. and um you know this refugee crisis you know Polish Polish hospitality has gone a long way and is showing the world how to um, 
behave in this situation. I think we're learning a lot from Poland right now. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and uh, you, you know, you mentioned the um, whole notion of uh, women uh, being left when their men have to go off to war. It's an it's a story in in Poland and in Central Europe that is hundreds and hundreds of years old. And I have a theory that it explains why these Polish women are so strong, because they have to they've had to take over, and. Uh, uh, during these totalitarian regimes, during these occupations, during these years of terror. And one of the things that they do very well, did very well in those circumstances was communicate. And they were very good at communicating in code. Uh, and uh, I, I think I get, I, when I was going to do a lot of, to do research on the Irena Sendler story, one of the things I learned about these women uh, and how they operated during the war was that for some reason, the um, Germans who had occupied Warsaw and they had bombed the city uh, initially and there were 50,000 people who died just in that bombing in 1939. So the city was in ruins and they had taken over everything but somehow they didn't figure out how to shut down the telephone system. So these women were on the phone with each other constantly. And the Polish women were on the phone with Jewish women in the ghetto. And that's one of the reasons why the Polish uh, operation to get children out and into safe places uh, was so successful because they were talking to each other on the telephone. Yeah. And they were also talking to each other in code and using secret messages. And one, one interview that I had with the woman, I said, how did you, you know, how, this was Sofia Kosak's daughter, by the way. I said, how was it that all of you knew immediately how to operate? As soon as the Germans took over, you started organizing these resistance efforts. You started putting out these underground bulletins. You started uh, locating places where that were safe. You started figuring out where food supplies were. You started figuring out who was in trouble and how to help them. How did you know how to do all of this when all of it was illegal? And if you were caught doing it, you would be uh, executed or sent to Auschwitz. And she said, oh, no, you don't understand. We, you know, we learned this from our mothers and our grandmothers, and they learned it from their mothers and their grandmothers. So this has been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years. I thought that was fascinating. It's really fascinating that you mentioned Sofia Costa. Could you maybe give a little bit of an insight to people who might not know about her? Because she's quite a big figure in the female fight for freedom, isn't she, in Poland? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just really, really intrigued with her because uh, uh, she had been through so much before World War II even began. And she she'd lost her homeland to the Bolsheviks and she'd lost a husband and she'd lost two children and she'd remarried. But in the meantime, she'd published these books that were read all over the world in many, many different languages. I, I recently discovered a copy of one of her books for auction in Greta Garbo's uh, possession. And uh, so people all over the world read her books and she was known and loved. Uh, and but she was in her 50s. I mean, she wasn't a spring chicken. Here, as soon as the war began, she got on, she's on her bicycle riding around the countryside circulating these illegal uh, bulletins that she's written, telling everyone what's going on, telling them to be strong, telling them to fight immediately. And one of the first things she did was uh, to help the director of the Rena Sendler School of Social Work, Halina Redlin, who was a very famous pioneer of social work in Poland. Uh, and she'd been hurt during the bombing and she was an assimilated Jew. So she was very much at risk. Sofia Kosak arranged for her to be hidden in a convent and she survived the war there and lived for many years after the war. Um, you know, what's so fascinating about, especially our knowledge about Poland is that, you know, our mothers, did leave a huge impression on us. And it has excited us to learn 
lots more about the country and learn about the traditions that we've been almost alienated from being um, brought up in a different culture because obviously I was brought up in the British culture and you were brought up in the American culture but um, you know there was this feeling of the mother having this heartache having this always longing for her country and I remember when my mother would come through the border the DDR during communism and um and I could I can still feel her excitement to get into Poland I would see those fir trees I would I I would see her face and the the breath of relief to be back in Poland at whatever cost um that stayed with me um unfortunately my mother as all you know refugees or you know people who have escaped a regime um had was worried about me becoming too close to the country because of all the um totalitarian communism she wanted to protect me in her own way and so she 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 actively tried to distance me from the polish community she saw it was um that she saw the corruption and she didn't want me to be around that she wanted me to have a british upbringing and to have british cultural um landmarks so um but i i i have to say that i absorbed a lot from my mother and i still do even though she's absent from my life rest in peace I still absorb a lot and I remember my 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 Highlander mother um, from the Polish mountains and how how she loved those mountains. She loved it and I have to say that her music, her love of the mountains, her, the paintings that she would buy, you know, they all all the images, everything that she owned from Poland has stayed with me and has enriched my life. Um, obviously being a snotty teenager, you don't always, <laughs> you don't always, you know, go, oh my goodness, what's she doing? Like my Polish mother's doing this again. Or, um, oh, she's made so much potato salad. She's gonna feed the 5,000 or something, <laughs> you know? But um, yeah, she had her own quirks and her own, her own things that she used to do that were could only be Polish. Um, you know, she had her own way of wrapping things up. And, you know, I remember the elastic bands, you know, the massive elastic bands that she would put things on the roof rack and tie up the boxes for her family, you know, lots of packages to Poland. Oh, yeah, packages yeah. and wrapping, very yeah. important, very important to. I don't know where that comes from, but they sure love to wrap up their, <laughs> but you know, they, my mother made the most elaborate uh, Christmas packages, you know, with <laughs> the ribbons and the things. If you, if you, if you're in uh, a big city like Bar Bar Warsaw or Krakow during Christmas time, and you buy something in a shop where they wrap it for you, even a bakery, you will get a work of art you'll get a work of art, you know, um, all the, the, the ribbons and the little decorations they put on the packages. It's something about, that's that hospitality again. It's something about, I have a, I have a gift for you and I have taken all this care. And even if it's an old piece of newspaper that I've used to wrap this box, I've done it beautifully, you know, <laughs> and I've decorated it. And my mother would, my mo mother would teach me how to cover a book you know that I wouldn't be able to get the book dirty and help me cover it and and um yeah we the happiest times I think were spent doing things like that with her or she made strange food for the British people that the <laughs> British people didn't really know what to take you know like how to eat it but you know my mother for instance she would grow loads of vegetables in the garden we had a big garden when we were growing up in the midlands and um for instance the beetroots we would go and pick you know dig these beetroots out i'd bring them to my mother she would wash them but she'd just put the whole thing in whole 
you know, into the whole thing in whole. In the, the leaves and everything and, and the roots and everything. All that what it is. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, just blitz it. But my mother, you know, remember what she had some other children and they'd never seen anything like it. But of course now, you know, you have lots of like beetroot soup recipes everywhere, you know, these trendy right. things are awesome. eating them. I'm like, I ate that. My mother, my mother used to feed that to me all the time and kombucha and fermented things that you just think, oh, now is like so you know, the posh people eat it or the people who are trending foodie websites. Like, my mother used to do that. She did that in the garage. <laughs> Nothing new there. Um, you know, making sauerkraut or something. Now it's some sort of like extra special skill. And it's just, a, it's funny. It's funny for me. because I remember having to cut those cabbages <laughs> and they would sit there. But I, I take a lot from my wild mother and I, I'm so grateful that she you know, instilled a sense of nature and gave me the opportunity. And I hope I get to, to live like that again, you know, where I'm, I'm close to the land and I'm able to get those big broad beans and, you know, take them out. Cook them them growing, things, growing things and, no, and, uh, and, and get so natural, natural appreciation of, um, well, of anim some, uh, you know, a gift with animals and, uh, <laughs> yeah, I remember the story you told me about her mum take, taking the plate, everything off the plate. What did she do? Because my mum did the same. She took all the breakfast food and she put it onto one plate. And then she took the plate and she went out on the patio and dumped it on the patio. And it would drive my father crazy because it would track all these critters from all over the neighborhood came to, to feast uh, on leftovers in our backyard. And um, some of them were the Swedish roof rats. Some of them were squirrels. Oh, no. <laughs> That's terrible. Some of them were, you know. Uh, what would she say when she's? Awesome. What What would she say when she's put it on the patio? What would she say? She would say, um, uh, uh, "They're hungry. I like. They like it. They're hungry. I like it. I like to watch them. You know." I mean, she would sit and watch all her critters eat her eat eat her the feast on the patio and she had all these birds she knew every single bird she knew every uh, she was feeding the birds she was feeding everything it drove my father crazy you know because and, and, and you said we had, that a zoo. That. we had a zoo in our backyard wow <laughs> and um yeah i mean uh you said that she said um this is for the animals <laughs> <laughs> don't throw it away it's for the animals it's for the animals can you tell the chicken story that's really funny that's really good oh i had this chicken uh i i in my biology class we were studying uh embryos in the under the microscope and so we had these eggs that we were um keeping warm and then when the class was over the teacher said does anybody want these eggs to take home and they'll hatch into chickens if you keep them warm so I took an egg and I had it in my bedroom and it eventually hatched and it became peeper my little pet chicken and it lived in my bedroom for a while and I and my mother would go in and take care of it while I was away at school eventually it got too big and it and we had to let it roam around in the backyard and so uh it was very hot in the summertime and uh we used to eat in the back, we eat out in the backyard, and we eat the, you know, <laughs> our chicken. And Peeper would be up on my mother's arm, pe pecking away at the chicken. And my father, was, you're eating your mother there, Peeper. And, my, my, and what, what did your mother like? say? What did you do? They're cannibals. They're all cannibals. <laughs> my mother said that. we had chickens as well. We had chickens, right? My mother knew this Italian lady called Angela, who <laughs> she she worked in the canteen in Loughborough University. And my mother, I always just remember these big orange buckets because Angela, would just, this is what you got when you got a Polish mother. This is what happens, right? There's a lot of negotiating, yeah, for you know things and food that cannot get got in somewhere else. You know, you have to use. <laughs> 
So she's going to Angela's, and Angela's giving her these big buckets of food that the students don't want to eat in the university. I mean, we're talking everything, you know, like steak pies, you know, <laughs> I mean, spaghetti, pasta, all mixed together. And my mother would take these big buckets and just throw them on the ground. <laughs> and I just remember these chickens and everything, the ducks, the chicken, the goat, whatever, whatever was there, just eating this spaghetti <laughs> and eating these like you know chicken drumsticks whatever it was there and I I remember like mum you're supposed to be feeding meat to chickens on the other so that's what she <laughs> <is>. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah no my mum you know this is what the thing is when you have Polish mums this is what happens isn't it you you, you know they're would hate to say that they have <laughs> <laughs> that's like <laughs> yeah you, you know you, how can you not be a bit odd I mean you know how can you not be a little bit eccentric with a Polish mother I mean it is a little bit diff difficult to be on a kind of normal scale even or ordinary if you've got you know, how are you supposed to be ordinary when you have a Polish mama you know yeah and it's it's hard I think you know there's also this survivor you know child of a survivor syndrome which is how can anything in your life be tough knowing what your mother went through how can anything in your life be tough because uh she will remind you you know that that she lived without heat you know and running water for and shoes. several years and shoes and, and things and, yeah and yeah but it's you know um intense poverty caused by a regime or caused by totalitarianism and um my mother you know bless her she wanted to give me a better life um, um but there were there were moments there that you know still having to work through and i hope that you know i hope I'm, I'm sure with your own film work mary you're you're approaching that topic as well um but ancestral trauma is something that does run in our community and it's something that has to be addressed if we're going to break the cycle and um if we can proceed to um, help our, help the blockages within our own families um, come through the tragedy of war. And, um, and in my case, you know, everything stems to that experience of being in those concentration camps with my grandfather, because what he then, ex then made the family experience has trickled down uh, the generations and um, unfortunately is still going on you know, estrangement, um, upset. Violence, um, brutality. Brutality, um, aggression, you know, um, uh, wounded people. Hurt, I read somewhere, hurt people, hurt people. Um, and artists have a role to play in the world. You know, they're here to um, express some things that can be very dark, um and bring light and new life to it um certainly something that you're doing with your film work you know as are you katie mm -hmm. and so i'm thinking do you have a song for us today it's actually yeah i do actually have a song <laughs> funnily <laughs> enough <laughs> wow i definitely do have a song yeah, all my songs actually are <laughs> inspired somewhat by my Polish mother, um, uh, even the very beginning ones, um, trying to work her out to understand our relationship. Um, obviously, now I have a wonderful relationship with my mother. My mother is with me everywhere. She's probably here right now. Um, and every time I sing, you know, uh, I feel her spirit and her energy. She, um, yeah, she really toughened me up for the world. Um, she made me understand that I have to survive. I was a very shy child and a delicate child, but, you know, um, had to quickly learn um, what it was like to live with a wild Polish mountain lady. <laughs> And so um, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great um, understanding and education. And I thank my mother every day. Um, there were difficult moments, but uh, she's with me every day. 
and nobody can take your mother away from you no matter how hard they try no one can take your mum away from you yeah we'll be with you all all the time and even if people say that you don't have a right to your mother's history or they say why are you here in Poland or why do you want to learn Polish history or because I had a Polish mother and she gave birth to me she opened her legs and pushed me out into the <laughs> into this planet and I have Polish blood and I'm proud of my roots because my mother made me understand that you know without roots you don't know who you are and for our mothers they were ripped away from their from their country um like so many refugees around the world and um just hoping that the, our, our sort of understanding of our own mothers might help um shed light on on on, on how valuable roots are i think uh you know, both of our mothers were traumatized and a little nutty, let's be honest. Uh, a little. <laughs> but, but I, a little. I think, uh, what, what, we both, what we both feel is that they gave us the best of their Polish roots. And, and for me, uh, I think what my mother, my mother, especially when we were young, when we were children and she was at her best, it was harder for her as she got older, but um, she gave us a love of, um, uh, of, the, of nature, of, of the outdoors. Uh, she gave us a sense that, um, you know, we could do anything outdoors. We could run, we could play, we could make things, we could invent, um, that, you know, we didn't need things. We didn't need possessions because our imaginations would carry us. She, she gave us her faith and, I'm very grateful for that, and uh, so those are the not those are the things um, that I consider my uniquely my my mother's Polish roots that that I'm I have the good fortune and I'm grateful for. And I think your mother gave you your courage and your backbone and your strength and other things, but I can see it in you, Katie. I can see it in you. I think they'd be very proud of us now. Um, I think they'd be very proud of us and they say, you know, certainly that we've, well, we, we outgrew them quite quickly, unfortunately, <laughs> because they, that's the way they brought us up to outgrow them quickly, you know, so it was a, a method of survival training from an early age, um, especially the firstborn. And um, so uh, my mother, yes, I, I'm going to sing a song that I actually had played at her funeral. It's called Motilek. It's, 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 it means butterfly in Polish. It's inspired oh, can you see? by the Polish, yeah, the Polish night fighter squadron that was named after Lvov, which is now Lviv in Ukraine. Um, obviously, before the end of the Second World War, Lvov was in Poland. Um, as I was mentioning before, the, those borders had been slashed by the big three. Churchill, Roosevelt and Stalin had redesigned the borders of Poland, which meant that, that basically anything Stalin said went. So a massive 300 kilometre tract of land from Poland's eastern border, which was known as Kresy, which included like Vilna which is now Vilnius or, you know, um, Lvov, which is now in Ukraine, uh, became part of the Soviet Union. And that's, you know, the banks are the only people that make money at the end of the day, isn't it? So um, this song, Motilek, uh, what can I say? It, I did get inspired to write it about the Polish pilots of the Second World War. But really, it's it's got a metaphor of um, a butterfly. Where are you flying? Because I can't see your colours and I can't see you. Butterfly, I have these romantic words for you, but you are flying somewhere else. I look for you in all those little corners and streets of Warsaw. Maybe you are 
on the cherry tree, maybe you are on the elderflower tree, come back to your country and I will be yours forever. Butterfly, where are you flying to? Um, because I can't see your colours and I can't see you. So this is Motilek, it's in Polish. <laughs> Motilku, 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 gdzie ci teraz lecisz? Motilku, 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 bo nie widzę tych kolorów i nie widzę cię. of my mum actually it's from it's in my album providence but my mum is oh. there she is with me and my mum finally united bring it up closer to the camera beautiful oh she's such a beautiful woman yeah can you see no butterfly butterfly my mm. mommy Oh, Polish mummy, rest in peace, mummy. Rest in peace. Christina. Oh, well, What's that fair. Well, what? What were you saying, Mary? Marisha, what are you saying, Marisha? I'm wondering where the Paddington Bear is today. Well, I don't know. Where are you? Where are you? <laughs> I think he's a bit silent. He's, <laughs> <laughs> he's thinking about mothers as well. Yeah, he's 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 a refugee as well, you see, and he's he's yeah, you're missing you're missing your Ukrainian mummy, aren't you? I think yeah. he's missing your I don't know, he's got a message. He says, eating my poppy seed reminds me of my Ukrainian mummy bear. Oh, oh. you poor baby. And where do you get your hat from? Is it from Ukraine? Yes, it's from Ukraine. It's his little hat. And he look, he's underneath, he's got his little rosettes because he's now, you know, he's come all the way from Ukraine. He's gone to Poland and he's now on his way to England. He's got his 
wellies because it rains here a lot you know it's got his little Paddington wellies there you go how can you not love Paddington <laughs> hey! oh Paddington yeah. take care of all of our, our yeah. friends We're take here. care of all of our friends in Ukraine and everywhere give them a big bear hug yeah big bear yeah. hug because everybody needs a hug in this situation and you know like Marisha said Mary you are now Marisha um, <laughs> you know even the smallest gesture of kindness can go a long way a, a very long way Oh, please, everybody remember that, how important, yeah. how important what you do uh, for a, a refugee is yeah. even the smallest thing. Please remember. And we are daughters of refugees, so we know what this means. Yeah. And, um, you know, we think that um, the leader of Ukraine is a wonderful, wonderful <laughs> leader. He's actually reminds us of Rok Mishvitol Pilecki in a little way, um, our cavalry wonderful officer um, who wrote the first report on the atrocities of Auschwitz. But he, he did something remarkable before this war, didn't he, Mary? He did, uh, but we learned the secret from the Paddington Bear because <laughs> he was the voice of Mr. Paddington in the Ukrainian program. And cool is that? Paddington told us, yeah. yeah. Eat lots of poppy seed, everyone. There you go, or sunflower seeds. Yes. Have we, how, are we here done now? We, we will see each other soon, won't we, Marisha? Yes, hopefully. Kasha. Bye, Marisha. Bye, Marisha. <laughs> Bye, Kasha. Bye. <laughs> see you all soon. We love you all. Love you all. Take care. Bye. Bye.